that is some good rock and roll. As if you didn't know. Uh, well, thank you for that. That was pretty awesome. Uh, got it by voice's introduction. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, uh, let me see. I got a few things at the top of this, my last briefing from the podium. Uh, first is a bit of official business. Today, the president hosted the first ever White House Maker Fair to celebrate a nation of makers and help empower America's students and entrepreneurs to help uh, to invent the future. America has always been a nation of tinkerers, inventors, and entrepreneurs. The president believes that the rise of the maker movement represents a huge opportunity for the United States. Nationwide, new tools for democratized production are boosting innovation and entrepreneurship and manufacturing in the same way that the internet and cloud computing have lowered the barriers to entry for digital startups, creating the foundation for new products and uh, processes that can help to revitalize American manufacturing. The White House Maker Fair features makers, innovators, and entrepreneurs of all ages who are using cutting edge tools such as 3D printers, laser cutters, and easy to use design software to bring their ideas to life. Some of these may very well create industries and jobs of the future. As part of this year of action and this week's focus on efforts that will expand opportunity by spurring manufacturing, innovation, and entrepreneurship, the President also announced new steps the administration and its partners are taking to increase the ability of more Americans, young and old, to have access to these tools and techniques. Uh, that's my official topper. Uh, then I wanted to mention that uh, uh, you, some of you may remember last week I came out with an Oakland A's hat, and it wasn't really an Oakland A's hat, it was the A's hat uh, uh, that my uh, son's team wore when they won the uh, championship in their uh, little league, their baseball league. Well, on Saturday, uh, my daughter's team, which was visited by the president, and after that visit, visit went on a substantial run of wins, won its championship. And while I don't have a Royals hat, although I'm trusting that Josh Ernest will bring one as a KC Royals fan, I wanted to say uh, thank you to the uh, Northwest Little League AAA champions, Kansas City Royals, uh, I know the president was glad to hear yesterday that they had won their championship. And for any of you with more than one child, you know you love them all equally. <laughs> so <laughs> finally, I just want to say thank you uh, to all of you here. Uh, this has been an extraordinary experience. And I have loved every minute of every day, even uh, the many minutes of many days I've spent in this room. Uh, as I think most of you now understand and believe, uh, it's always a pleasure, no matter how hard it can get in here, how hot it can sometimes be, and contentious uh, it sometimes is. Uh, you know, the president, to many of us, said uh, that of the jobs that we have here in the White House, that most of us will never be in a position to do more good for more people as we are in right now, and we should take advantage of it. And that is something that I think we all here take to heart. And I don't ever expect to be in a position again to be a part of something uh, that has at least the potential to do more good for more people. And that has been a very special thing indeed. Uh, I loved my years as a reporter. Uh, but as you better than anyone else understand, reporting and sometimes, uh, sometimes can be a, an autonomous uh, exercise. It's your story. It's your byline. What was so different about this experience for me is that it was all about a team effort and all about a goal that had nothing to do with any individual, not even the president. And that, uh, that's been extraordinary, extraordinarily gratifying to be a part of. Um, what I won't do, although if uh, uh, provoked, I will later, uh, is go uh, through a list of all the things, uh, the very many good things that have been accomplished by this president, this administration, uh, in my time here uh, that I believe represent doing a lot of good for a lot of people in this country and around the world. But I think that record is a good one and one I'm proud of. Uh, I guess with that, I'll go to questions. Uh, at the end, I'd like the opportunity to say thanks to uh, my colleagues. Um, you know what, I'm going to do that now because I have a feeling it could get lost a little bit. Uh, first of all, to the President, the Vice President, the 
the First Lady and Dr. Biden my deep thanks for this opportunity. The Vice President took a chance on me. Two years later, the President took a chance on me, and I hope uh, I uh, didn't give either of them any regrets. Uh, the Chiefs of Staff that I served, uh, Dennis McDonough, Jack Lou, Bill Daly, Rahm Emanuel, Valerie Jarrett and Pete Rouse, David Pluff, uh, a key uh, advisor and friend and mentor, Dan Pfeiffer, Jen Palmieri, Alyssa, Alyssa Mastromonaco, <coughs> Nancy Ann DeParle, Rob Neighbors, Kathy Rumler, Amy Brundage, Jen Saki, Katie Byrne Fallon, Anita, Danielle, Tom, Susan, just the list goes on, Tony Blinken. These are extraordinary people, Ron Klain, Ben Rhodes, Jeff Tiller, Marissa Hopkins, Hallie Ledbetter, all superb individuals with whom I've had a great privilege to serve and have some good times with. I thank them all. Uh, Marvin and Pete, I think I probably owe you some money, but thank you as well. Uh, and everyone else here, I know I've forgotten a lot. The, the uniformed and presidential uh, protective division secret service agents are uh, extraordinary people who serve their country and uh, the president uh, and uh, others so well. The folks uh, who work in this building um, and who work on uh, Air Force One, I'd like to thank them. And then finally, I'd like to thank you. I think some of you rem may remember Ben Feller, who was sitting in that chair, uh, uh, asked me on my first day as my first question about how I viewed this job. And I said, first of all, we all are here to serve the president and the country. Uh, we work for him. But the press secretary is in a unique position within a White House, and not just because I'm a former journalist, because I think every press secretary understood this and understands it. Uh, we work to promote what the president is doing and the message he's trying to convey to the American people. But I also work with the press to try to help you do your jobs, to help you cover the White House, cover the administration, and report on what we're doing here. Uh, and that is what I've tried to do. Uh, you'll be the judge of my success, at least in part. Uh, finally, uh, I want to say thanks to my deputy, Josh, uh, soon to be uh, White House Press Secretary. Uh, no one has been more ready to do this. I want to say thanks to Eric and Sean. Uh, uh, you guys are in good hands with them. Any questions? Thanks, Jay. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues, congratulations on making it to your last briefing. I wish you the best of luck in Thank your you. post White House endeavors. Um, if we can get to Iraq, the mm -hmm. president is meeting with lawmakers here this afternoon. Is he going to be in a position to tell those lawmakers his decisions? And if he's not in that position, how much longer can he afford to wait to provide the Iraqis with assistance given? What officials here have said is the urgency and the gravity of that situation. First of all, the President, as you noted, will meet uh, today at 3 p.m. with Senate Majority Leader Reid, Senate Minority Leader McConnell, Speaker Boehner, and Democratic Leader Pelosi at the White House as part of his ongoing consultations with congressional leadership on foreign policy issues, including here, obviously, the situation in Iraq. It's part of our ongoing consultations with Congress on this issue. When it comes to the uh, options that the President is considering, first of all, I want to make clear the President has ruled out only sending U.S. troops back into combat in Iraq. Ultimately, the solution that is needed is an Iraqi one, and any U.S. action, including any possible military action, would be in support of a strategy to build the capacity of the Iraqis to effectively and sustainably counter the threat posed by extremists. We have been clear about the elements uh, that we are reviewing. First, how to most effectively deal with the urgent and imminent threat from ISIL, how to build the capacity of the Iraqi security forces to fight this threat in both the short and long term, and how to encourage Iraq's leaders to put aside their differences and facilitate non-sectarian cooperative governance. Military action is a component of the options the President is considering. But to reiterate what we have been saying, this is not primarily a military challenge. Iraq needs help to break the momentum of extremist groups and bolster the capabilities of Iraq's security forces, but there is no military solution that will sustainably solve Iraq's problems. And any consideration of military action must be informed by the situation on the ground and the objectives to be obtained, as well as the consequences of its use. Uh, so the meeting today will be part of a process of consultation with Congress. The President 
obviously will inform him of uh, some of uh, inform the leaders of uh, his thinking on uh, some of these issues, uh, but we'll also want to hear about their thinking. <coughs> we here in Washington, obviously, and this includes the leaders who will be visiting, have spent a lot of time over the past decade uh, thinking about and understanding uh, Iraq and the complexities there. Uh, so the president looks forward to having this meeting. It sounds like you're saying he has not made any decisions. And so I'm, <coughs> I'm wondering, do those decisions get harder, though? Does that situation on the ground get harder the, the longer it takes for the U.S. to provide some type of assistance? Well, I would say a couple of things. The, the right way to go about this is to assess uh, is to develop an approach that is uh, inclusive of the three elements I just mentioned. It cannot just be about what direct action we may or may not take. And it also has to be one that keeps in mind what our objectives are. The ultimate objective here is to protect the national security interests of the United States, to prevent uh, portions of Iraq, uh, portions of the region from becoming a safe haven for uh, ISIL, extremists who uh, may ultimately uh, pose a threat to the United States over our interests abroad and our allies. Uh, and that is the lens through which the President approaches uh, these matters and these decisions, and, and that obviously especially includes any contemplation of direct action. Ultimately, Iraq has to take responsibility for uh, its own security. We in this country spent more than eight years, nine years, uh, and uh, spent a lot in both blood and treasure uh, in an effort to give Iraq the opportunity to move forward democratically uh, as a sovereign nation. And we are still obviously a very, in much, a very much in support of Iraq and the Iraqi government, but ultimately they have to make some key political decisions about uh, governing in a non-sectarian way, in an inclusive way, uh, because only that will uh, create the kind of insta uh, uh, stability that Iraq needs to move forward and protect its sovereignty. I know the President has ruled out putting combat troops on the ground in Afghanistan, but he has notified Congress that up to 275 American forces are going to, Af or I'm sorry, Iraq, going to Iraq. Officials have said that he is considering uh, special forces to do training missions there. What does that say about his willingness to put Americans on the ground in a deteriorating security situation, even if they are not there specifically for combat? Well, first of all, we have had, certainly prior to this circumstance, uh, many situations in which military personnel have been uh, used and uh, their numbers reinforced when it came to, became necessary to protect embassy personnel. And as you know, uh, the decision over the weekend to send a number of teams totaling approximately 170 U.S. personnel uh, to Baghdad uh, from within the U.S. Central Command area of responsibility is about providing security assistance for embassy personnel inside Iraq. Uh, they will engage in uh, efforts to temporary, temporarily relocate some of uh, our staff from the embassy uh, to U.S. consulates in Basra and Erbil and to the Iraq support unit in Amman. Now, there have been a number of times when we have filed similar war power resolution letters uh, when we have needed to augment existing security at our embassies, and this is consistent with that. Um, the military has also moved approximately 100 personnel into the region to provide airfield management security and logistic support if required. Uh, but we are not, uh, that is a very discreet and distinct mission, we are not, as the President has made clear, contemplating a return of U.S. sending uh, U.S. troops back into combat in Iraq. But you are putting Americans into a country that has a crumbling security situation, are you not? Well, again, for this uh, absolutely important mission, mission, which is to ensure uh, the security of our personnel who are there, and we have obviously, although we have reduced the number of personnel uh, and have relocated and are relocating the ones that I mentioned, uh, we do have a number of Americans uh, there, and it's the right thing to do to make sure that we have the personnel necessary there to be uh, to provide them the security they need. Jeff. Jay, congratulations. Thank you. Good luck. Thanks. Is that uh, it? Yeah. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is, the is the president leaning one way or another on airstrikes? Uh, you know, if you read the news today, you'd, you might be confused. And I think that that just reflects that the fact is the President is assessing the options available and he is approaching this with uh, uh, 
the three objectives that I mentioned in mind. Uh, and, and the one that involves contemplating uh, direct action uh, is part of the whole, the three objectives. We can't, uh, ultimately we can't uh, be in a situation where we are, uh, the United States and our military forces are the sole guarantor of stability in Iraq. And I dare say that is a view held by a vast majority of people around the country and here in Washington. What we can do is uh, engage in an effort to make clear to the Iraqi government and leaders in Iraq that it is absolutely necessary for them for their own uh, medium and long-term security and the, and the cohesion of their country to take steps to govern not in a sectarian way, but in a non-sectarian way, in an inclusive way, and to make clear that that is their objective. And uh, you know, one of the reasons why we have seen the uh, instability uh, in uh, portions of the country and the ability of ISIL uh, personnel to make the gains that they have is because of the uh, failures of the Iraqi government to govern in an inclusive way and to make it clear to all sectors of society in Iraq that the government represents and defends all of them. Uh, and it is essential that the Iraqi leadership take steps to uh, repair that situation. That is an important element in uh, our approach to Iraq right now. Uh, any action that he might contemplate when it comes to direct military, the use of uh, military force would be to deal with the immediate and me medium-term threat posed by ISIL and to uh, make sure that uh, our first and foremost objective in uh, the region, which is to deny extremists a safe haven, safe haven is pursued and achieved. Uh, those are the, that's the clear-eyed approach that the President has when it comes to what our objectives are in Iraq. Can you give us a sense of a timetable on when that <coughs> decision will be made? I would, uh, uh, not be able to do that for you. I think that it is uh, absolutely appropriate for the President to continue to uh, both consult with Congress and to uh, move forward. Uh, and when he has any announcements to make, he'll make them. One last question. Sunni militants attacked the largest oil refinery in Iraq today. Um, is the White House concerned about oil disruptions? And as Jason, Re Jason Furman referred to yesterday, uh, are you considering tapping the SBR to deal with those disruptions? Well, I think there was some uh, inaccurate reporting about <clears throat> what uh, Jason said. Uh, on, as you know, I don't comment on uh, that specifically except to say that we monitor the situation. We continue to monitor the situation. When it comes to the uh, question about concern over the price of oil and uh, any uh, uh, effect that the cir cir circumstances in Iraq might have on that, we are monitoring continuously the global oil supply and the demand situation. And my understanding is that uh, at this point we have not seen major disruptions in oil supplies in Iraq. Uh, on the refinery that you mentioned, uh, my understanding is that we have not seen, as I said, major disruptions in oil supplies from Iraq. And the refinery itself produces for domestic Iraqi consumption uh, and had stopped production already several days ago. Uh, but this is obviously something that we monitor regularly uh, and um, both uh, localized in Iraq and, and any effect or impact on global supply. Did the markets misinterpret what Jason said about the SPR? Uh, I'm not going to comment on markets. Michelle. So the Iraqis at least twice now have asked for airstrikes. Um, obviously the administration doesn't feel like now is the time. They feel like it's the time. So why doesn't the president feel like now is the time to do something like that? <coughs> Michelle, I, I think that it's important, again, to look at the approach the President is taking here and understand that it is not the options that he is considering and the approach that he is pursuing is not one that is uh, delineated solely by questions around the potential use of direct military action. The only thing the President has ruled out, and I want to be clear here, is sending U.S. troops back into combat in Iraq but he continues to consider other options. And obviously work is being done uh, that will help us 
uh, see with more clarity what the options available to the President are as part of a cohesive strategy that includes uh, working with the Iraqis uh, and urging them to take action to demonstrate to all of the people of Iraq that the government is representing all of them and that the security forces are uh, engaged in an effort to fight a common threat to all Iraqis, which is what ISIL represents. Uh, ISIL does not have the interests of any Iraqis at heart. It is a brutal extremist organization uh, that seeks to, as we have seen in recent days, uh, capitalize on instability to terrorize the residents of Iraq and elsewhere uh, for uh, its own ideological purposes. Again, they have uh, no uh, shared objectives with any of the citizens of Iraq. Uh, and I think that the government, in our view, needs to move forward in a way that uh, recognize that there is a shared interest in uh, all of Iraq all of Iraq's uh, peoples joining together in the effort to combat the threat posed by ISIL. So it sounds like what you're saying is you're <coughs> waiting for the Iraqis to show something or some kind of ability, either politically or militarily. What does the administration think of their ability to hold Baghdad? Well, I, I think that I know that others uh, don't let the lack of expertise get in their way when they comment on, you know, situation on the ground and military capacities of Iraq, uh, Iraq security forces or of ISIL forces. So I would uh, urge you to consult uh, true experts on that. Uh, we are looking at this through the lens of our national security interests. And uh, again, the President has not ruled out anything uh, except for sending U.S. combat troops into Iraq. And uh, he has always maintained a position that uh, the United States retains the right to act in defense of our national security interests uh, when the commander in chief views that as ne uh, necessary. And he retains that uh, right in this case and in all cases. But again, taking direct military action uh, by the United States will not solve Iraq's challenges, uh, certainly not alone. Let me move up and back as I, why should I change now? Cheryl. Thank you, Jay, and congratulations. Thanks. Um, just so you won't miss us, um, <laughs> <laughs> does, does the administration support a repatriation tax holiday to pay for the depleted uh, highway trust fund? Cheryl, I could always count on you in changing the subject, yeah. and I appreciate that. I, need to do it. I, I can talk about mid-session <laughs> review, too. <'cause> um. <laughs> The President does not support and has never supported a voluntary repatriation holiday because it would give large tax breaks to a very small number of companies that have most aggressively shifted profits and, in many cases, jobs overseas. In 2004, just 15 firms got more than 50 percent of the benefit, uh, with tax breaks worth billions of dollars on average. The JCT, as you know, Cheryl, probably better than anyone else in this room, predicts that a, re that a repeat of the 2004 repatriation holiday would cost nearly $100 billion over 10 years. You know, the President's view uh, is, I mean, he's put forward a plan for uh, paying for the kind of infra infrastructure investments that we need, and, and uh, he believes that that's the right plan. Justin. Um, congratulations, Jay. Uh, we can stipulate that if you guys want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I kind of wanted to follow up on what I asked you last week, which was both whether you guys feel like if you were to move ahead with any type of military strike, if you feel like the existing authorities kind of are there under maybe the authorization to go into Iraq the first time under a different authority. Mm -hmm. uh, some Senate Democrats have said that they think that you do need to go back to Congress. And even if you do think that you do have that authority, whether the President feels, as in Syria, that it, the nation would be stronger if, if he consulted Congress and I don't vote on this issue. Well, he is consulting Congress, uh, as you know and we've discussed already. Uh, 
when it comes to the AUMF that you mentioned, uh, the Iraq AUMF, AUMF, the authorization, authorization for the use of military force, the administration supports the repeal of the Iraq AUMF since it no longer is used for any U.S. government activities. Now, we understand that some in Congress are considering legislation related to the Iraq AUMF, and we look forward to working with them. Uh, what, uh, I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals about uh, action the President might take since, as we discussed earlier, he is still reviewing his options uh, when it comes to uh, direct action. So uh, I think I would say we'll cross that bridge when we get there, if we get there. Olivia. Uh, thanks, Jay. Um, in light of the, uh, the performance, the lack of performance of the Iraqi uh, armed forces, is the President taking a fresh look at readiness reports coming out of Afghanistan? Well, I think that the uh, two com countries are obviously different, and we, we look at uh, assessments of uh, readiness in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, in the context of the situation in each country. We obviously have invested a lot of resources and paid a heavy price in both countries uh, as part of our effort to allow governments in those countries, selected by their people, to secure their nations and um, produce for their people a better future. Uh, we have uh, important relationships in both nations that uh, include security assistance. Obviously, Afghanistan, we still have many troops there uh, in an advise, advise and assist uh, mission at, uh, at this time. But I think it is important to note that we, as a country, engage in an effort to help stand up Iraqi security forces uh, and uh, train them and support them. We continue in that effort. We have missions even to this day, uh, absent uh, a presence of U.S. troops in Iraq that still uh, assist in the training and supporting of uh, Iraqi security forces. Uh, but ultimately, the, the challenges that we have seen reflected in the uh, inability of those security forces to control portions of the country, reflect uh, the failure of the government to govern effectively in a cohesive and inclusive non-sectarian way. Uh, and we can take steps to help deal with, help the Iraqi people and the Iraqi government deal with the immediate threat posed by extremist groups like ISIL. But in the medium and long term, it absolutely has to be uh, Iraqi leaders who take the steps necessary to ensure that the security forces are up to the task and will uh, provide security for the whole country and for all uh, citizens of that country and all regions of the country. So, so no, no new look at the Afghan approach. This isn't a cautionary tale for the, the effort. I, I just I, I think that we are constantly, our teams are evaluating the effort uh, that continues to improve the capacities of the uh, ANSF, and uh, that effort will continue. We obviously have a circumstance in Iraq now that uh, requires uh, assisting Iraq in efforts to deal with the immediate threat posed by uh, extremists uh, and, and assisting them as they hopefully make the choices necessary to uh, succeed in the medium and long term in dealing with the challenges they face. John. Uh, Jake, can I come back to this question of authorization? When, when the President uh, was considering airstrikes against Syria, he made the decision that he would first go to Congress to get authorization for an attack on Syria. Uh, is he considering anything similar regarding Iraq? Would, would, does he believe that he would need or would prefer to have congressional authorization before uh, launching airstrikes on Iraq? I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals about decisions uh, that the President may or may not make uh, with regards to the use of U.S. military force in Iraq. Uh, I would note, uh, at least for the sake of uh, clarity, the uh, differences you would see in those circumstances where, in this case, as someone noted in an earlier question, the sovereign government of Iraq has requested assistance. Uh, 
but uh, beyond that, I'm not going to speculate. Make a, does that make a significant well, I, difference? Beyond that, that, I'm not going to. Well, I think it, uh, it certainly is a distinction and difference worth noting. I'm not going to get into, uh, again, hypotheticals about uh, decisions the president uh, has not yet just, made. Just to play that out, why would that make a difference? I understand in many levels why it would make a difference, but in terms of congressional authorization, because Congress would be authorizing the use of military force. Uh, not whether or not the other government was inviting us. Right? It's a question of whether or not. I understand the, right now. The president has that authority. I'm just asking if, if the White House believes he has the authority. Well, I know, and that question was asked earlier, and I'm not going to speculate about uh, an issue that uh, uh, has not come to pass. Okay. Uh, and then, um, I, I'm sure you've had a chance to, or you've seen this uh, op ed piece that former Vice President Dick Cheney has written in the. Wall Street Journal and has a, a, a rather um, critical tone to it uh, towards the White House. Uh, it says, rarely has a U.S. president been so wrong about so much at the expense of so many, uh, talking about the situation in Iraq and in the Middle East generally. Which president was he talking about? Um, <laughs> I believe he was talking about President Obama. I, uh, look, it's obviously always uh, good to hear from former Vice President Cheney. You and I. Uh, each know him reasonably well. I, I think many others have said that uh, it's pretty clear that President Obama and our team here uh, have distinctly different views on Iraq uh, from uh, the team that uh, led the United States uh, to invade Iraq uh, back in 2003. Uh, so he's entitled to his opinion. Can, can I just get two specifics of what he says, though? He, on one hand, he says that. Uh, the, the group terrorists, the group ISIS, has taken over more territory and resources than any terrorist group before in history, uh, and the president goes out golfing. Um, and he seems blithely unaware or indifferent to the fact that the insurgent al-Qaeda uh, threat uh, poses a, a uh, clear and present danger to the United States. So I would just like your reaction to the vice president saying that the president's out golfing um, when he should be paying attention to this and he seems unaware or unconcerned. I think it's pretty clear the President has been paying close attention to this and has been engaging regularly with his national security team. It's also clear that the President is being very deliberate about decisions uh, uh, surrounding the question of the use of uh, American military force. Uh, and his belief is that we should always be very deliberate in uh, that kind of decision-making process and that we should uh, very carefully weigh the consequences, both desired and undesired, that can come from uh, the use of uh, U.S. military force, and we should have a very clear focus in mind about what our national security objectives are and what we, the United States, can achieve through military force as opposed to what, in this case, the sovereign nation of Iraq and its security forces uh, can and must achieve uh, unless the proposition is, as some uh, in the past have suggested, the United States should uh, have uh, occupied Iraq uh, in perpetuity. That's simply not the President's view, President Obama's view. Chris. Jay, thanks. Based on some of the latest reporting that I have seen, the rebel forces are about 40 miles north of Baghdad. Is that consistent with your understanding? And I know you don't want to give a specific timeline, but can we still expect the President to make a final determination within a matter of days as opposed to weeks? Uh, <coughs> Look, there is a lot of work that is ongoing at the direction of the President around the situation in Iraq. Uh, he is continuing to consider options consistent with the ongoing war, and he has not ruled out uh, any options beyond uh, deploying U.S. troops back into combat in Iraq. So I, beyond that, I'm not going to get into timetables, uh, except to say that a lot of work is going on already around the general proposition that I laid out in the beginning of this briefing and the three objectives we have that have to govern uh, an approach to Iraq that has anything but the absolute short term in mind. Uh, so uh, when it comes to assessments of what's happening on the ground, again, as I said earlier, uh, I will uh, refrain where others have not and not pretend to uh, be an expert on the situation on the ground. I would refer you to those who are. The President has said that any action taken by the U.S. will depend on Nouri al-Maliki uh, creating a more inclusive government. Have you seen any steps that he has taken that you can point to su to suggest that he's actually doing that? 
or is he hunkering down? Is other people said? Well, first of all, uh, it is absolutely, I think, self-evident that uh, the future of a nation like Iraq, with its diverse population, uh, is dependent upon the willingness of its leaders to govern inclusively. Uh, at least the cohesion of the nation is dependent upon that. And that has been a proposition that we have been uh, discussing with Iraq's leaders for a long time. And uh, it remains true today. And there's no question that not enough has been done by the government, including the Prime Minister, uh, to govern inclusively, and that that has contributed to uh, the situation and the crisis that we have today in Iraq. And this is a democratically elected government. It is a, uh, it is a country that has just undergone another uh, election and which is in the process of the formation of a new government. Uh, and uh, you know, what, what is obviously clear is that you know, Iraq and the people of Iraq choose their leaders. And uh, we can only be clear that all of Iraq's leaders must uh, about what they uh, they must do to unify the country and the people and effectively confront this threat. Um, I, I would point out when it comes to the steps the president uh, can take or might consider, they're uh, you know th they are part of a whole package. Uh, what is also true is that uh, our primary objective is to not permit extremist groups like ISIL uh, from establishing a safe haven and the surest way to achieve that uh, is for the government of Iraq to uh, govern in a way that is inclusive and that uh, by being inclusive more effectively establishes security and stability throughout the country. If not enough has been done, as you say, then should Maliki step down? That's not obviously for us to decide. As I noted earlier, this is a, a country that has had uh, democratic elections. There was a recent election uh, that produced results that requires the formo formation of a coalition government. Uh, that has, uh, at least in recent past, been the process that takes uh, some time, uh, given the circumstances. You know, moving expeditiously is obviously a good idea, but that is something for the Iraqi people to decide, not for the United States or any outside nation to decide regardless of the decision about who is prime minister or what that government looks like, we will make the case that Iraq's leaders need to proceed in a way that is reflective of uh, the interests of all of Iraq's citizens and all regions of the country and all uh, uh, parties and uh, religious affiliations. That is the only way for a nation like Iraq to succeed, ultimately, in the medium and long term. And just one more on a completely different topic. Does the President have a reaction to uh, the fact that the Redskins trademark was canceled today? Uh, I haven't spoken to the President about that news, but I would note that last October, in an interview with the Associated Press, uh, he was asked about the issue of the team name and said, quote, if I were the owner of the team and I knew that there was a name of my team, even if it had a storied history, uh, that was offending a sizable group of people, I'd think, about changing it. Uh, so that's the President's view. I have no new view uh, of his to provide to you. The decision today was made by the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. I think maybe Cheryl knew that existed prior to this, but I bet most of you didn't. Uh, and it's an independent administrative tribunal within the Patent and Trademark Office. The board is authorized to determine a party's right to register a trademark with the federal government or, if the party already owns a registration, its right to maintain it. The board is not authorized to determine whether a party has the right to use a trademark, just whether it has the right to register it. Uh, so for more on this, I would encourage you to contact the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Major. Jay, can you describe the limits of the White House willingness to cooperate with Iran dealing with the crisis in Iraq? I can tell you that we uh, are open to engaging the Iranians, just as we are engaging other regional players on the threat post, uh, posed by ISIL in Iraq. As you know, the issue did come up briefly between Deputy Secretary of State Bill Burns uh, and Iran on the margins of the P5 plus 1 
in Vienna on Monday. There may be future discussions at lower levels, Major, uh, though we do not expect the issue to be raised again during this round of P5 plus 1 nuclear discussions in Vienna. And to be clear, any discussion about Iraq is separate and will be separate from ongoing nuclear talks. On the broader question, in, in any possible conversations with Iran, we would encourage the Islamic Republic of Iran to act in a responsible, non-sectarian way, and to encourage the government of Iraq uh, and all Iraqi leaders to do the same. Iraq's sovereignty must be respected, and the government of Iraq must focus now on strengthening its internal political and security institutions in a non-sectarian way. And the solution to Iraq's security challenge uh, does not involve militias, but the strengthening of the Iraqi security forces to combat threats. Any engagements we have with the Iranians will not include discussion of military coordination or strategic determination about Iraq's future over the heads of the Iraqi people. Do you want the Iranian government to rescind its general call for Shiite militias to protect religious shrines in Iraq? I, I would say that. Uh, ISIL is clearly a threat, uh, a common threat to the entire region, including Iran, but Iraq will only successfully overcome this threat by governing in a non-sectarian manner, uh, building and investing in the capacity of Iraq's security forces and addressing the le legitimate concerns of Iraq's Sunni, Kurd, and Shia communities. Turning to Iran uh, is not going to accomplish these important steps and it won't solve Iraq's problems. Uh, you know, Iraq's leaders need to make decisions that reinforce the idea for all of Iraq's citizens that the government represents all of them and defends all of them. Uh, and uh, governing in a sectarian way or reinforcing a perception that uh, the central government is pursuing sectar sectarian interests uh, is not a recipe for success when it comes to uh, dealing with the common threat posed by ISIL. As the process to form this coalition government plays itself out, after the most recent election. Is Nuri al-Maliki the optimal leader of that process? Would there not be a better chance of it succeeding if he and those closest to him were open to a possible alternative? And would the United States be supportive of an alternative? We don't choose Iraq's leaders. We encourage uh, all of the leaders of Iraq in this government and in the future government that uh, has to be formed uh, as a result of the recent elections uh, to pursue non-sectarian governance. Uh, that is the way that uh, Iraq can successfully uh, maintain its security. During his history, is Maliki the optimal figure to do that? Again, it's not for us to make that decision on behalf of the Iraqi people. Do we have an opinion? Iraqi, the Iraqi people will have to decide uh, the makeup of the, of the next coalition government and who is the prime minister. Whether it's the current prime minister or another leader, uh, we will uh, aggressively attempt to impress upon uh, that leader the absolute necessity of uh, rejecting sectarian governance, uh, rejecting an approach to Iraq security that has sectarian goals uh, in mind, uh, but rather governing and uh, pursuing security in an inclusive, non-sectarian way. Uh, that, that's the only way uh, the divisions within Iraq are managed and healed uh, in a manner that will allow for Iraq to prosper in the future. That has always been the case. And uh, we have, uh, as the country, expended a lot of our, our most precious resources in an effort to give Iraq the opportunity uh, to uh, govern itself as a sovereign nation and to and a democratic nation and to take responsibility for the security of the nation. We continue to have an important assistance relationship with Iraq, and we always, in a circumstance like this, continue to be focused on our national security interests and potential threats against the United States uh, and our people and our allies. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the Iraqi people have to decide uh, 
their future. Uh, we're there as a partner and a friend, but they have to decide. Last question. Uh, it's clear the President would like many questions answered. Among them are these. Can you give me reliable target information on the ground? And the absence of that is in part related to the lack of U.S. eyeballs on the ground to provide not only the target, but the assessment of what would be successful or not successful. Other things you would like to have answered <coughs> is an assessment of the fighting will and capacity of those security <coughs> forces in and around Baghdad. Does the President's declaration that there will be no combat forces prevent him from sending those who might be best skilled at answering those questions to Iraq to find out those answers, to give him better options? The President's been clear, as I have again today, that uh, that is not an option he is considering. We are not sending U.S. troops back into combat in Iraq. Uh, but that's the only option he's ruled out. We are obviously uh, assessing uh, a variety of different options. We are pursuing uh, an approach that uh, has as only one component, the contemplation of direct action we could take. Uh, the questions you asked at the beginning about uh, fully understanding uh, the objectives that could be achieved by direct action is, is absolutely appropriate. But uh, th as I mentioned earlier, a whole lot of work is being done uh, as part of the President's approach to this challenge. And, uh, you know, when he has uh, any decisions to announce, he'll announce them. And, and in the meantime, I think you can be sure that we are uh, uh, taking an approach to Iraq that, that is governed by our view of, of what not only we can do to assist Iraq, but what Iraq must do to assist itself. Just to make sure I understand, sending people to try to answer those questions would constitute sending combat forces? No, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals about uh, how uh, we make assessments uh, about the situation on the ground. What I have made clear is that the President uh, is ruling out sending U.S. troops back into combat. Uh, we obviously have uh, a lot of efforts underway uh, that allow us to uh, assess the situation, allow the President and his team to assess options. Yeah. Hey, congratulations. Thanks. Ahead of uh, this important meeting at 3 o'clock with congressional leaders, some of the Republican leaders are saying ahead of that that they think the worst option would be for there to be no U.S. action. But from some of your earlier comments, you seem to suggest that, as the President wants to be deliberate here, uh, that if he has a decision to announce, he'll announce it. Does that suggest that one option on the table is no U.S. military action? Again, I think it's uh, Anytime you say, as the President has on many uh, occasions, uh, that he's not ruling out and never does the use of military force in a circumstance like this, uh, that's not uh, ruling in uh, or, or saying there is a certain use of military force. So it's not a foregone well, conclusion that there will be U.S. military action. He may decide that the Iraqis do not have a strategy and he might not feel like using U.S. military force makes sense. Is that right? Well, the President will make decisions based on his view of what's in the best interest of the United States and our national security. Uh, we obviously have, as the President said last Friday, uh, a keen interest in the region uh, because of the uh, potential threat that a uh, safe haven for an extremist group like uh, ISIL uh, could pose to the United States. Uh, that is why uh, the President is considering a, a variety of options as part of an approach, again, that is not limited to, although it gets the most attention, not limited to this consideration. Uh, when you talk about ISIL uh, and <coughs> their influence, uh, one thing that former Vice President Cheney mentioned in that op-ed that was talked about before is the President's recent New Yorker interview where he talked about how there's a big difference between Al-Qaeda Central, Bin Laden having a network that's trying to launch attacks against U.S. homeland, and then you've got these splinter groups like an ISIL or ISIS as some call it, um, uh, that might not be able to launch terror attacks. But now people are saying, well, wait a second, maybe they can take over an Islamic state uh, and turn it into an Islamic state and launch attacks. Uh, and the President said in that interview with New Yorker, quote, if a JV team puts on Lakers uniforms, that doesn't make them Kobe Bryant. Uh, 
Did the president misjudge the influence of some of these Al Qaeda offshoots that maybe they could launch terror attacks against you? The president's been very clear, as have the senior members of his national security team, that our principal concern has been for some time uh, those Al Qaeda affiliates that have demonstrated that they pose at least potentially the most direct threat to the United States are people in our interests. Uh, that would obviously include AQAP and it could potentially include ISIL. Uh, and so we have been very focused on these uh, regional affiliates uh, and, and the threat that they pose as core al-Qaeda has been diminished. Um, it is certainly, uh, it was certainly the right thing to do to diminish core al-Qaeda, to go after the uh, central governing authority and, and decision makers who perpetrated uh, a catastrophic attack against the United States on September 11, 2001. I think. I hope senior members of the previous administration would agree with that and the objective uh, uh, that was pursued and uh, has in uh, substantial measure been achieved. That doesn't mean that we don't pose other substantial threats. The president and every member of his, of his national security team has uh, been uh, very clear about that. And we have, as you have seen as a nation, in our collaborative relationships with other uh, nations as well as acting on our own, taken action to uh, where we can mitigate the threat posed by extremist groups to the United States, and we'll continue to do that. And to deal with this threat, you were telling Major how important it is to press Prime Minister Maliki to reform. Uh, if that's the case, why did the President have Vice President Biden call Maliki last week? Why hasn't the President called Maliki directly to make this case? Look, I think the President's views are very clear. The President has uh, had uh, conversations with Prime Minister Maliki in the past uh, the that include before. this very issue. Uh, the Vice President of the United States has uh, obviously uh, keen uh, expertise uh, and uh, very deep relationships in Iraq among all of the leaders there. In the two years that I uh, served as his communications director, I believe we went there seven times, and uh, he has certainly been there uh, often since then. Uh, and it's entirely appropriate that the Vice President of the United States uh, speak directly with uh, leaders uh, in Iraq as he has consistently for so many years. One other topic before you go. Uh, what happened to Lois Lerner's emails? I, uh, Ed, I would refer you to the IRS, and they've answered this question. Uh, they, you know, they, they can answer it again. Given the fact that they were requested, I think, about 10 months ago, and it was just Friday, uh, we, Congress was informed that they've apparently been missing, will the White House pledge at least to guarantee that you will work to find them? Since previous officials at the IRS have testified to Congress under oath that there's backups of these emails. So do you think, you've previously said you'll cooperate with legitimate oversight. Is it legitimate, legitimate to find these emails? Uh, as the IRS has said, Ed, they are producing 67,000 emails sent or received from Lois Lerner. This is part of their production of 750,000 pages of documents to Congress. As the IRS said, IT professionals worked to restore Lerner's hard drive but were unable to do so. Nonetheless, the IRS has or will produce 24,000 Lerner emails from this 2009-2011 time period, largely from the files of the other 82 individuals. So I think that answers your question that they are engaging in an effort to find uh, emails uh, in the absence of uh, being able to restore the hard so drive. So also make sure that as many as possible that can be recovered will be recovered. But, uh, the IRS obviously is taking action that I just described to you to uh, supply, uh, in addition to the 750,000 pages of documents to Congress they've already supplied, additional emails uh, as they can be recovered. Um, Chairman Camp, as you know, requested emails to and from the White House. Uh, we were asked if we would produce them. We did, in fact, do a search for all communications between Lois Lerner and any person within the Executive Office of the President for this period. We found zero emails sorry to disappoint, between Lois Lerner and anyone within the EOP during this period. We found three emails where a third party emailed both Lois Lerner and officials within the EOP. One was a spam email and two others were from a person seeking tax assistance. Each of these emails uh, has been produced to Congress. Well, trying to seek her emails with members of Congress and staff on the Hill, I believe, right? Again, I think the IRS is demonstrating uh, that it is undertaking this effort. Thank you. Yeah. Mara. Um, Thank you for a hard job well done. Congratulations. Thank you, Mark. Um, a question. If, if the primary national security objective of the U.S. is to deny extremists a safe haven, 
and the most efficient way is for Maliki to form a, you know, a govern in a non-sectarian manner. Um, has the President come to any conclusions about whether that is the only way? In other words, barring those reforms, is there anything that we can do on our own, short of occupying Iraq, to achieve that objective? I'm not asking what he's decided well, to do, just whether he thinks it's even possible. There are several levels of hypotheses to that, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to tackle it this way. Uh, it is certainly uh, the best way to ensure that an extremist group uh, cannot establish a safe haven in Iraq and this region. And that is why it is important to be clear about the three pieces, the elements that I talked about how to deal with the urgent threat from ISIL, how to help build the capacity of the Iraqi security forces to fight this threat in both the short and long term, and how to encourage Iraq's leaders to put aside their differences and facilitate non-sectarian cooperative governance. Uh, it is always the case that when it comes to threats to the United States, the American people, our interests, and our allies, uh, we and the President obviously, as Commander-in-Chief, take action as he sees fit. Um, I think that's the best way I can answer your question. But the ultimately, setting aside assistance we are providing and other assistance we might provide uh, in the effort to deal with the urgent threat posed by ISIL, Iraq's leaders need to take the steps that we've discussed. And that is the surest and best way, as it has ever been, for short of a permanent occupation by the United States, well, uh, short, uh, short of that, of assuring that uh, Iraq is a sovereign, secure nation that doesn't provide a safe haven to uh, these extremist groups. But two of those three goals that you mentioned, building the capacity of the Iraqi military and uh, facilitating non-sectarian governance, those were our goals before 2011, before we left. So how we had more leverage then, now that we're gone, how do we, how do we achieve those goals when we're well, not there? We, we still have a very important when we were there. and uh, substantial relationship, including an assistance relationship with Iraq. Uh, but I, I think your question, in many ways, provides the answer, which is that uh, it has always been and will always be uh, the case that Iraq must take responsibility for its own security. Ultimately, they will have and do have in the United States uh, a partner in that effort. But Iraq is a sovereign nation with a democratically elected government. And they need to act uh, and make decisions uh, at the political level to ensure that we have uh, in that country uh, for the sake of the Iraqi people, uh, the potential for a better future. Jay. Okay. Juliet and Khan. Since a couple of vice, former vice presidents are weighing in on public policy matters, Al Gore wrote today <laughs> that the president has signaled he is likely to reject the Fed presidential permit for the Keystone Pipeline. Can you share, has there been any private discussion between the former vice president and the president that would lead him to this conclusion? The President's position, our position on uh, the pipeline has not changed. The process that is housed at the State Department uh, continues. Uh, and I've seen that report, but I, I, I don't have any light to shed on it. Uh, the, the process continues. It's being run by the State Department in keeping with the practice of administrations of both parties. Connie. Thank you. Just to wrap up, are Americans any safer now because of what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan? And secondly, shall we keep one of the seats warm for you in the press room? <laughs> <laughs> I can definitively answer one of those questions. <laughs> uh, Connie, I, look, I think that our men and women in uniform principally, their families principally, our civilian uh, Americans who served in harm's way in those countries provided extraordinary service, and in doing so, uh, have uh, made our country safer. There are obviously hist issues around the decision which then uh, State Senator Obama opposed to invade Iraq that historians will 
chew over for a long time. But there is no question and no debate about the extraordinary service provided by uh, our men and women in uniform and by those who supported them. And that uh, we all uh, benefit from that and we are all grateful for that uh, from the commander on, in chief on down. Um, but this is not, when it comes to the safety and security of the United States and the threats posed uh, by those who would do us harm, this is an ongoing proposition. Uh, and it's one that uh, the Commander in Chief uh, and his successors uh, will always be vigilant about. Um, and that is why, as we discussed earlier, we keep our eyes on emerging threats, uh, even as we deal with the threats that uh, pres were present when uh, we got here. And uh, that will continue to be the case. Uh, I am very confident, uh, even as I step away from this podium, which I'm about to do. Thanks, Jay. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Jay. Jay, uh, before you go, I just want to come and say in front of all your close friends here, um, on behalf of uh, your team and on behalf of the President, thank you. I want to say thank you to you. I want to say thank you to Claire. I want to say thank you to Hugo. And I want to say thank you to Della. Um, we are going to miss you dearly. Uh, you've done uh, un uh, unrelenting uh, good work and unrelenting good service for us. And we're deeply appreciative. Um, and how you deal with our, our partners here in the press. So, uh, Jay, thank you very much. We're going to miss you dearly. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I'm sure uh, we'll see each other again. Take care. Jay, is this your last day? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, no, not at the White House. Sorry, my last briefing. A couple more days here. I'll take that question. So when do you give uh, Josh the launch codes and everything? Oh, I couldn't possibly reveal that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.